campus called the Commons Initiative, uh, commons.sfsu.edu. Um, and those of you who are in my class have talked about this before. Uh, commons Initiative, we basically you know, gather ideas around free software, open source, creative commons, on campus, off campus, connect the dots, sort of bring those things to you, and then take your work to the outside. And so um, I, I connected with these guys a few weeks ago. Uh, Printerbot is in the open source space, very interesting uh, 3D printing, and so we got to talking, and then this is how the session came about. Um, so there's sort of three parts to this. One is, of course, the technology that you're seeing here, the products that are coming out of it. Um, then there is the creativity and innovation aspect of it, which is, now that you know this is possible and how it works, what will you do with it? And then sort of the whole environment of um, new products uh, as they come into the market, uh, what needs the address, and so on. Um, and of course, my interest is with the open source side of things. So, um, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Brooke Drum. And there's Jeremy in the back there running the printers. Um, if Brooke can't answer any questions, ask Jeremy, right? Yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. So, I want to let you guys know first of all, thanks for having me, you guys. Really appreciate it. Uh, just a pleasure and good to be with you folks. Thanks for coming. I wanted, wanted you to get to know me just a little bit. My name's Brooke, and about three and a half years ago, I didn't know anything about this stuff, like nothing. I didn't know a printer. Um, so the first thing I did was save up money, and I bought a MakerBot, about the only thing you could find at the time if it wasn't a uh, RepRap, which stands for Replicating Rapid Prototyper. The fascinating things about these printers and where I started was with a RepRap, totally open source, give the files away so that people can print the files and make other printers so they replicate. So what happened was I put the, uh, the cupcake together. It was called cupcake because it made parts as big as a cupcake, about three and a half inch cube. And uh, when I put it together with my family, uh, my kids, you know, I taught my six-year-old son to solder. <laughs> Probably not a good idea. But uh, it was hard to do, you know, and I was like, wow, we're on the, on the verge of something exciting. And um, just I was totally loving the fact that you can design something and have it right there on your table. I've been like carving stuff out of wood or making stuff, trying to weld stuff together, making out of metal. It's very messy, sometimes dangerous, and very, very slow. But to be able to design something and have it done and hold it in your hand, it's interesting. And you guys are, are making products, right? Some of you guys are, are doing that now. The difference between on the screen and in your hand is huge. And so I really saw, once I started printing these parts, I, I, first thing I designed was a printer. Um, and I used a 3D printer to do it. So it was the full cycle of, okay, rapid prototype, or let's prototype. So there on my kitchen table, um, I just started printing parts, trying to make this printer, first of all, print better. It printed like crap. Um, and Bree Pettis, the CEO of MakerBot, wouldn't be upset by me saying that. At first, it was very, very you know, meager beginnings. Um, it was limited. The resolution was terrible. The speed was horrible. The sound was horrendous. I mean, everything was bad, but it did work. And so that was the big deal. So wanting to take that to the next level, I wanted it to be cheaper. I wanted it to be faster. I wanted it to be um, more accessible to people that wanting to build them, because I'm a maker and I like to build stuff. So I wanted to do that. I knew that someday that we're going to have to have printers that are just like, drop, like Q, uh, drop it on the table and navigate the pad and print something, right? I think you're going to find out that no 3D printing is easy today. It's still not easy. Um, it might have been easy for me to bring in this red one over here, which is our latest model releasing next month. The easiest that it's ever been with a printer bot, sat it down, dialed in the file on the SD card, hit start, and it actually worked. Um, like a year ago, you'd see me still fiddling back there, like getting everything dialed in. Uh, it's still hard, but I want it to be easier. So anyway, I started designing that, and one of the things that I decided was, since I was totally honest, I mean, I didn't know anything about this stuff. Now, yeah, I was a tech guy, I was building websites, I was somewhat, I coded just a little bit. I mean, I understood about design and drawing and um, different mediums and like aesthetics, um, but it, even like user interface. Uh, so that was kind of my, it's not even my background, this is all like stuff I picked up. But I, I was, I knew it had to be, in the end, um, easier and, and look a little more approachable, accessible. So that was the goals. But I knew that I had to be an expert, and I wasn't one, so I was very upfront about that to people. I started a meetup group. And so, and that's really the first bit of advice I always, anybody I speak to, I, t I tell them, if you're going to be an expert, you got to stand up and lead, right? you got to get people together that are passionate about what you're passionate about. 
and riff off each other, ask them to test your products, you know, even like the elevator pitch for the business. You have to share it with everybody. So I was doing this meetup group in Roseville, California. It's, it's around the Sacramento area, right? So I'm a couple hours away if you get all the way up to Lincoln. Um, so anyway, I lived there and was doing websites there, and one of my clients offered me a trade. You know, I give him a free website. He gives me a shop to like hold a class like this. And so uh, two people showed up first time, man. And I was like, oh, yes! <laughs> you know, I'm like, in the door! I got two people! Never met them before in my life. And they just found me on the app, on the iPhone app. And they showed up. And they were like uber geeks. You know, one was a fourth programmer, if you even know what that is. The other one worked at Intel, like soldering CPUs on a thing to fix stuff. And I was like, okay, we're off and running. Next week, more, six, ten, out, went all the way up to 60 people. They like, crammed in this little room. Everybody's jazz, right? This was a couple years ago, two and a half years ago. So who's seen the, the 3D printer for the first time today? You guys are like slow, right? <laughs> <laughs> you hear in technology and you haven't seen one until today? Well, good for you. But that's what they did. They heard about it and they showed up and they wanted to see it work. And so that was like, they were really excited. Man, what's possible? And this was back when it was like crappy. <laughs> you know, it was like really hard. So I decided, you know what, I can't, even though uh, MakerBot did open source their first two or three printers, um, totally, you could download the files. Uh, one thing they did, interesting, and, and I want to kind of touch on some of the open source stuff. Um, first thing they did was release the files, and then they did not update them. So that's one thing that happens with open source. It's like, fine, here, have it. The maintenance of that, and like all of the forks that go out in all different directions, very difficult to actually stay current. And Jeremy will tell you, you know, he has to run the shop at PrinterBot, and I'm always changing stuff all the time, making it better all the time. And then you've got this trail of legacy that you're dragging behind you and trying to make sense of what version do you have? Why didn't I use a versioning system? <laughs> and it's, it gets really problematic. So, but I, I, I applaud MakerBot for starting in that open source community. And so anyway, I could have sold MakerBot cupcakes, but I want to do my own thing. So I looked at the open source community, the RepRap, and the one that was most interesting to me, I, it took months of like just going to the IRC and trying to get to know the leaders. That like, and what's funny about 3D printing is it's a very small community even still. I know like everybody in 3D printing in this space, the, the consumer space. I go to shows, um, I get to go overseas a, a couple times a year, and I meet everybody. I met the designer of the Prusa, the Prusa Mendel. That was the most popular one. It's this, it's this funny dude that's just like another guy like me that started in his apartment or whatever. And, and I got to ask him about some of the design choices he made and stuff. It's just really fascinating to meet the people that design the stuff that I was like, wow, that's awesome. So I tried that, and it, was, it looked like, if you've ever seen a, a, a Mendel rep wrap or a Prusa Mendel, so, it's funny because software guys in England, design and professors, and um, he wasn't a product specialist though. He was like a guy that was fascinated by game theory, and uh, he did some software stuff, um, Python programming and things. And he was not a product design guy. And it showed when the I saw the plans for the Mendel. And again, these started as print you print the parts, go to the hardware store, buy the stuff, put it together on your table. So I downloaded the plan or the, the files for the Mendel, and I mean, not joking, there's like 200 parts. Unbelievably complicated, and from a mechanical design you know, viewpoint, it was terrible. Um, so Joseph Prusa uh, took that and simplified it greatly. I still thought it was too complicated. I mean, there was a lot of structure support um, that I, I thought we could take it out. So I started stripping away everything we didn't need, and then I kind of had this aha moment one night where, um, and I'm a real hands-on guy, I, I'm just now learning to like 3D model in a proper CAD program, believe it or not. The first product I designed in SketchUp, like 100%. And that means that I banged my head up against the wall so hard, but something broke, the product sold, you know, the, the, not my head. But it was very slow, it's so funny too, little side note, been using uh, SketchUp, and I'm a real fan of products, open source products, and free products, that allow kids, quite frankly, um, to get into it for zero dollars. Because a lot of times, I've really seen that the barrier to entry on a lot of this is just the cost of whatever it is you're into. 
You know, um, I wanted to get into BMX biking when I was a kid, couldn't afford it, so I got a Space Invaders bike instead, with like banana seat and the whole nine yards. It was what I could afford. Uh, so with 3D printing, I thought we got to we got to choose software and demonstrate that it's possible to do a product that can actually sell to the public based on free software. So I didn't do SolidWorks. I've taken SolidWorks courses. I can do it. I'm just slow because I don't use it every day. Um, you can use Inventor, um, and now we do use those. But it's not me. It's guys that are really good at it. Me, I'm kind of like the I, I see the vision for what I want to do, and I just do it through just hard work and doing it however I can do it. So even now, like Jeremy is helping me with the new Go printer, it's a suitcase printer, it's quite large. And um, we have uh, like Illustrator for our laser cut files. You can see on this right here, um, the PrinterBot Plus, it's done in birch plywood. And so what's wonderful, I could print those parts, but man, look how long that would take. Um, so laser cut wood is or plastic is super fast for prototyping. And so what I did with Jeremy is like, here, here's a half done printer. <laughs> Let's try to get the three quarters done. And then how many times did you tear that thing apart? Literally 15 times. I would have said 20 maybe, and we would probably get to 20 by the time we're completely done and out the door. But I like to build it first and then hold it in my hand. So back before the company launched, I'm doing this meetup group and trying to figure out how can I get from the Prusa Mendel complicated kind of science experiment looking thing to something that's uh, simpler. And so this one night I was listening to this podcast, like a tech podcast, and just I'm constantly thinking about it. I not, not only started a meetup group, but I just researched nonstop. I mean, I literally for eight months became completely obsessed, and I mean that in the very worst way. I mean, my family suffered, I didn't eat, I mean, like all kinds of crazy but I thought there's only one way I'm going to become an expert, and that is time, energy, um, just going after it as hard as I can. So that's another little lesson that you don't have to be an expert. You can learn what you need to learn. You can do what you need to do, but you've got to get talented people around you, and you've got to work harder than everybody else, and you've got to move faster. So over the course of eight months, um, I, I finally came up with this idea in my backyard. It just dawned on me. If I bring, and you can see it on the plus there, if I bring everything into the center on this block, this like, section of like this rectangle cube thing um, and just bring the, the bars up and out. My first model that I did, I did my first like prototype, I went to Lowe's the next day. I, I went inside and drew it down on paper in my journal and then it hasn't changed much since then. I, I went to Lowe's the next day and I went back to the very back, because I didn't have a lot of money, went to the back of the store for the bargain bin wood and I found a little piece of, uh, literally it was like fence post. and. It was like two dollars, and so I took that home, spent my two bucks, cash. And I went home and I drilled through that, and I had some bars. I put two bars through, I put two bars up, and then two bars across those other two bars, kind of like taping it together, just looking at it. I was like, this is gonna work. So I started designing um, based off that first prototype that was just a block of wood, and that gave me a chance to hold it and see the, how big do I want this to be. And then I started designing it to be built with metal bars. And so that first one was plastic pieces with metal attaching rods and just simple, simple, like cut it with your table saw type of stuff. Well, it started to actually um, take hold when I did the next thing is, like I said, always get your products out there for people to use early, 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 like really embarrassingly early. I don't know how many times we talked about this over lunch, but being willing to completely and totally fail and look like an idiot that's what you need if you want your product to go to the next step. Because I was, you know, I'm new at this. I don't know, will this even work? And mechanical engineers would say, that is not going to work. They were wrong about some of that, by the way. Uh, mechanical engineers have a ten tendency. When you're too smart for your own good and you've been living around a, a product or a way of thinking, a process that is like really ingrained in you and like, this is how you do it. You know, use this software and you do these supports and all that, and you stress test it and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's all in like software and, and like on paper with drawings and stuff. I want to build the thing and use it and then point to the, you know, the result. And that's how you find out what this thing can actually do. Build the car and drive it. You know what I mean? Don't talk about how good the specs are. Um, so I've never been one, just incidentally, I've never been one to say ours is the fastest printer, ours is the highest resolution. Ours is this, ours is that, because those are so kind of hard to 
uh, first of all, they're hard to prove. You have to get everyone to agree. Okay, let's, let's find a level playing field, all right? When we talk about speed, you know, and there's all these weird ways to look at it. It's like the CPUs back in the 90s or the 2000s where everybody's like one-upping them, you know, but it didn't just matter about the CPU speed, it mattered about the graphics processor and the RAM and all this. So I never say anything like that. What I say is, mine is the cheapest. Because that I can argue, we've all agreed on a monetary system here, and we are absolutely, that, that print, I have a printer for $349, and it is a kit, I, I'll build it for $449, but $349 for a simple um, printer box. That can't be argued with. So the, the first one was a $500 printer, and that was a price point that was like dramatically less. The cupcake I bought was like on closeout sale at like $700, $800. It actually retailed for $12.99, and when they came out the new model, it was a little more expensive, and it's just gone up from there. Now MakerBots are, you know, like $2,600, $2,800, something like that. And you know, it goes all the way up to like almost six grand for this 18 right? So they're going up to a prosumer level, and I'm coming down to like a kid and his mom at a kitchen table, uh, because I think the the market for that is so much more broad than you know people that are willing to spend six grand. Anybody spend six grand on anything recently? <laughs> Who spent 350 bucks on something recently? Okay, like three people. You all should talk to them. Uh, exactly. So anyway, uh, so that $500 price point was what I was 4.99. Um, was shooting for. So I got it to where, you know, after some use and some failures and uh, some very, very, uh, that's another thing, when you put your product out there, if you don't have thick skin, you will soon or you won't be in business uh, because the critics out there are unbelievably vocal. And I used to say, oh, I have really thick skin because I always have. I didn't know how thick it needed to be because uh, I would start taking some of that stuff personal. It's really hard to hear, you know, that is just fascinating. It's hard. But the reality was I didn't know, so if, if they have something to uh, a, a valid point, then I'm listening. So over time, uh, we, uh, we changed some of my bad ideas and they got better. And I got to a point where it was actually printing. I mean, this is printing as good as the cupcake and it's going to be 500 bucks. So in order, and I, by the way, I said, uh, who in here has a 3D printer? Nobody had one. Actually, one kid showed up at 14 years old with a printer like mine. And he was like the most enthusiastic like kid. And just his grandpa had to drive him every month to come to the meetup group. He'd stay late. He'd come early. We'd trade tips. And just got to talking. Now he works for me. Uh, I, that was the first guy I hired. As I was in my garage, um, Caleb would show up at my house, and we'd have soup at the counter. So very meager beginnings. But anyway, so we got it to where it was actually printing, and I decided, okay, we gotta, we got to get some money in here to like buy enough stuff for, for these to sell. And I wanted to sell 50. I'd already invested quite a lot of money, actually. I seeded 10 people in the group with a beta. And so I pushed them out there to these people, and they volunteered. Of course, it was a freebie. So I said, who wants, you know, $700 is what it cost initially. Um, so uh, who, who wants a 3D printer? And they all did. So I, I gave them out and I said, just one caveat. If you don't want to buy it when we're done, all the parts are free to upgrade. All the new designs are free. In fact, you'll be printing your own upgrades. Um, but uh, it is going to be open source, so I wasn't worried about the files. But if you don't want it at the end, you got to give it back or you can buy it at cost. So I figured I'd get my money back. I don't think I got any of those back. In fact, just the last, a few months ago, I got the last one back. This one girl didn't pay me. So I just said, you got to bring that back. So I have like one of the original ones in my shop now. But anyway, so um, lots of great feedback with those people using it. It was invaluable, but it used all my money. <laughs> so uh, I just, and I was like leveraged out on credit cards. So um, I told my wife, we can mortgage the house, we can sell the cars, uh, or we can do this thing called Kickstarter. And she was like, we're doing that. That's what we're doing. No investment, done. You know, so I was like, okay. And I remember the day that it launched, I told her um, several points. Some of it's blurry, but several points stick out. And one is, I didn't care if it worked or not. I was going to do this company. If you're going to start a company with a new product, you have to be so unbelievably bullheaded and stubborn and tenacious to drive that company forward at all costs, no matter what. And so I remember thinking, I don't know if this is going to work. In fact, I was really embarrassed to say $25,000 goal for 50 printers at $500. I was embarrassed. It's like so much money to ask for. Um, 
I, but I told her, I don't. I launched the campaign. You got to jump through all these hoops. Finally got the videos done and everything, and let's launch. And I uh, told her, we're going to do this no matter what. And she was like, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, whatever. At least I got you to do this so it'll get into your head that you're going to fail. You know, My wife's a great lady, but she'd been putting up this for 20 years of marriage. You know, next idea, next idea, next idea. Kind of a serial entrepreneur. Um, so anyway, uh, that first day, I remember getting my first bing. You know, my iPhone said, uh, oh, get it. Somebody pledged, and I was so excited. I got on the site, and uh, I couldn't believe somebody actually put money down for this project until I found out it was my sister-in-law, Sarah. <laughs> One dollar! <laughs> I was like, dang it! And she was like, I think that's neat, you know? Somebody did it. Anyway, so I was like, you put her up to this, didn't you? But anyway, so, but not long after that, it, ding, 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 it just starts going off, and I had no idea the interest in 3D printing, or at least the price point for that particular product. The price point is so essential. And uh, by the end of that day, it was maybe closer to two days, it funded all 25,000. And then it just went up from there. And at the end of 30 days, it was $830,000. Totally blew me away, and my wife. And uh, she, you know, I was gonna build 50, and she saw me over the last eight months, you know, make 10. And uh, she was like, 50? I'm never going to see you again, you know? So it went to 100 and 200, 500 and 1,000. And she's like, turn it off, turn it off. <laughs> we are not turning this off. <laughs> anyway, so that's like the story of how it started. And uh, to fast forward a little bit, a couple of key moments in PrinterBot's history. One is, um, first and foremost, is managing the expectations of the customers in Kickstarter. It's a bit of a unique animal because it's not a store to go buy stuff, except for the fact that that's how we all treat it. It's a store to go buy stuff, <laughs> you know? Uh, but there's legally, I didn't have to deliver Jack, right? You didn't have, in fact, many people thought I'd just run to Mexico with the money. Uh, and by the way, here's how the economics work. 830 some thousand dollars. Amazon handles the payments, so they take 5%. Kickstarter handle, you know, was responsible for the whole thing. So 5% um, to them, so 10 percent is gone. $750,000 lands in your bank account like two weeks later. Very unfortunate for me. Um, it landed in like December 30th. And it is considered income, personal income. Now there were some people that, there were some people that uh, decided um, it's not really income, is it? I don't have to pay taxes on this, do I? <laughs> I made a decision early on that, with the help of my tax guy, um, that we're going to treat this as income. And over the past three years, I've paid over $330,000 of taxes on that initial boom. So when you're planning your business plan, and if it involves Kickstarter or some crowdfunding thing, make sure you're in that plan financially, you're, you're saying you know, half of it is going to be taxes because it could be this huge thing, yeah. Did you have a lot of expenses offset that? Or is it still kind of so, like, like a lot of Kickstarter guys, I did my math. This is what it cost to build, times 50, you know? And then it went to 1,200 units. And I thought, well, that'll scale, right? Um, I didn't have literally any taxes accounted for in there. What I did find out was, and I was like really, 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 uh, again, tenacious at trying to find cheaper and cheaper and cheaper ways of doing things. So from the beginning, I always knew PrintBot was going to be a brand based around value. Um, not cheapness, but like getting the job done good enough. So I mean, and maybe a, a good example is this one that um, is right here, the junior. Um, we, a mechanical engineers look at that and I'm like, and like I could take that and wobble around the top and it would shake a little bit um, because it's not as structurally sound as a lot of the other printers. What I know that you don't know is, it's ex first of all, it's extremely rare to print something on the whole build volume, right? So the expectations of the person is, yeah, let's build something huge until they start printing and it's ridiculously slow. Like I've been printing for how long on that one? You know, over half an hour. Um, and it's about half done, a little over half done with the base. And that's a single wall print that's completely hollow. Um, it's not going its fastest, but it's at a modest rate. So. We have these big printers and we print small things um, for the most part. So anyway, that design was good enough. It is not the most rigid, but it's good enough because I wanted the cost to be down. So anyway, 
when you scale up, obviously it's obvious, when you scale up and buy more of more bearings, the price does go down. So because the economy of scale went up so high, the demand was so high, I was able to order enough in bulk that my cost did come down. So I, I figure the Kickstarter was probably about a wash um, if I could have tech kept that tax money and just spend it all on the business. But that included getting a space, like we left my garage, uh, one guy that uh, worked for his dad in a junkyard and a 14-year-old volunteer and me in my garage. <laughs> we got a space, we hired a few more people, that's when Jeremy showed up um, at our first little thousand square foot like factory under a pizza joint. <laughs> And uh, so it, I was able to pay some rent, I was able to buy a whole bunch of stuff, buy one laser cutter and then another one later. But I knew I was running out of money so I have to get this store open and this has to be a business, not just a Kickstarter. By the way, not all products are businesses. A single product business is one that's very, very uh, fragile because you know, you're standing, it's a one-legged table. Uh, somebody can tip it over pretty easily. So I want to do other products, other printers, and even um, we're just now getting to the point where we can finally, it's, a, it's time is the issue right now. Uh, we're, you'll see us do some other products that are outside of the 3D printer hardware space a little bit. Um, so I decided I'm going to open the store to the public even before the Kickstarter campaign was done out of necessity. And uh, that pissed a bunch of people off. Um, they wanted their printers before anybody else was able to even pre-order or buy. But I had to have the money, so I remember uh, really nervous launching the website for the first time, and there it goes again. It, like in one weekend, 100 grand, and all these printer orders, and I'm just like both very happy and very sad that PayPal thought I was a fraud and yeah. shut the account down and kept the money. So I was like, "You kidding me?" And I, you know, they called me. When PayPal calls you, <laughs> that's a bad day. <laughs> And this guy, very professional guy, a risk management guy, oh, we got to know each other real well because he picked through every bit of finances, personal, business, Kickstarter. I just spent hours on the phone educating this guy about how I'm an actual businessman with an actual product and I will actually deliver what I'm selling. Um, finally, like it took almost a year until they stopped reserving a percentage of every sales for them to manage their risk. Um, so while PayPal is great in some respects, they're the devil in other respects. <laughs> but you know, you kind of get comfortable with the fact that you're like, wow, that two and a half percent or whatever, you're gonna have if you're gonna take money from people, unless you're a cash-based, you know, system, you're gonna have to be comfortable with giving up a, a pretty good chunk of your margin to just the management of the processes involved in doing business online. So anyway, we got past that started selling and it's just gone up from there. Um, over the past two years I've probably developed pretty much by myself. I, I get help from guys like Jeremy that take, I'm a bad finisher to be honest. Um, I'm a great starter uh, so you, I know my weaknesses now and so do all of my employees <laughs> and uh, I had to surround myself with people that could help me finish strong. Um, so, But probably maybe 15 different printers in two years. And so that's one thing about a lean company, and we're definitely a lean startup. Um, a lean company has to be able to move very, very quickly. We were talking about, um, at lunch, we were talking about how some organizations, uh, in order to change the way that they're doing business, is like turning a big boat. You know what I mean? It's like you want to be a little speedboat out there in the water, and you know, pff, like turn around, you turn, go anywhere you need to avoid whatever obstacles. And these big behemoth companies with a lot of legacy they're dragging behind them, very difficult to make a change. Um, I've watched MakerBot um, come out with consi pretty consistently new models, new models, new models. Not a lot of innovation. Now it's, it's starting to accelerate now that they've been bought for you know could amount to six hundred million dollars from Stratasys, um, but. They've got deep, deep pockets, lots and lots and lots and lots, 30 years of IP. I mean, they're like set. <laughs> and I'm this scrappy little guy in a garage in Lincoln, you know, in spirit. Um, but if you move quickly, you can actually keep up with that. Um, just a couple other points on differentiating, dif differentiating your business from the competition. And I don't mean to pick on MakerBot, by the way. I'm a fan of 3D printing. And that is uh, something that you're going to do with the printer, not the printer itself. 
And I, I always like to say it's not about the printers. I formed my business based on 3D printing, not 3D printers, but I happen to sell 3D printers. Um, really, if we get down to the nitty gritty, I formed my business on rapid prototyping and you know, fast, quick to market product design. So I'm really more of a product guy than anything because you, I think that I have a talent to, um, first of all, bring people together and that's like a social skill. You know? How does that work in business? Well, you look at, and now with Steve Jobs as the exception, he's probably not a nice guy to hang out with, rest his soul, but um, for the most part, my business has really done well because I'm a people person and I can identify talented people, their superpower. I talked to investors and I, I talked to Tim Chang, he's this famous guy down in the Silicon Valley. Sat down at this big, long, like, 30-foot table, you know, totally intimidating. And uh, drove my crappy Prius there, you know, next to all the cars and walked in in my T-shirt. Sat down and uh, his first question, super smart dude. First question, what's your superpower? And I was like, what the crap are you talking about? <laughs> you know? at, the end of, at the end, he goes, I know your superpower. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he goes, it's uh, networking, putting people together, identifying talent and putting them together. Second, product design. So I was like, oh good, that means I'm going to be all right. <laughs> you know, it's not like some obscure thing. But anyway, so identifying the talented, the people that are talented and can engage in your vision and your kind of focus, um, that's what I do. So it's really more about product design and putting people together for a vision than it is like figuring out some kind of recipe. That's one thing that worries me, honestly, about classes like this. Um, I, I, I'm sure your professor could tell you that some of you, privately, he might tell you, you're going to do very well because you have an actual talent. There's some of you that may not do well because you're trying to force something that is not natural. And there is a recipe to a certain degree. I can tell you what the balance sheet needs to look like and like the margins you need to go for, but that's a recipe. I think the really great standout designers, it's like we were made. And so, when I look at product, it's maybe a little differently than somebody that's learned the recipe of product design. Jeremy always tells me, and not to throw Jeremy under the bus, but he told me this maybe even yesterday or two days ago. I was brainstorming and going all through this stuff, and it's a mess. Um, and then, you know, he's like, whoa, whoa, yeah, we can do that, we can do that. He, he, he said, Brooke, you're, it's your vision, but I'm going to help you get there. Um, I don't see it all, the big picture, but, you know, give me a few, like, focus things to work on, I'll do those. So, anyway, um, really product design is what I'm passionate about, so I'm excited to, to talk to your class. I, I want to give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, those are the most fun for me. I get tired of hearing my voice. So, do you guys have any questions? I mean, I, I'm a really open guy, and uh, maybe to a fault, but I'll tell you anything you want to know. It's a rare opportunity for you to talk to somebody that's so open book, so fire away. Yeah? How much of this was printed? The body or the All of it, well, except for the two shocks that are kind of green. Those I ripped off of my son's RC car. The tires are printed uh, in, uh, uh, let me talk about the materi materials real quick. So there's PLA, polylactic acid, biodegradable, corn based, ABS, uh, like the rims, the real glossy stuff were done in like an acetone bath, so it like smooths and like melts, smooths out the ABS and you get kind of a neat finish. Um, it was printed on a bunch of different printers at my shop in a very short amount of time to just kind of show, and it's, I put it together super crappy because I didn't have all the bearings and all this stuff. I, I didn't have time to order them. But now I've ordered some of that stuff and we're going to get it running. It has a plastic gear train. Everything's going to be printed. The tires are, uh, uh, it's called flexible PLA. Um, the materials are really coming a long way. There's still a lot of room for improvement in materials. But uh, they're hard tires because I printed them thick. I printed them real squishy at first, but they were somewhat fragile, so I haven't like struck that balance yet. But I figured kids are going to be pawing all over this, and I wanted to last at least. So don't judge it by the poor construction techniques based on the materials I had at hand. But it's all uh, it's going to run just as good as the RC cars that we have at home for sure. And it's open source, so I can modify, share it back with the community, and end up with a final product that's every bit as good as what I bought in the store for like okay. hundreds more. Print the screws too here? No, I know. Oh, okay. The okay. screws aren't printed, sorry. Okay. Yes? I was going to say, um, the questions that are beautiful for the camera. What? 
Oh, oh, oh. So, yeah, repeat the question. I'm sorry. So, what was the first question? Is that RC car fully 3D printed? Like 92 and one half percent printed. There's hardware and uh, two of the shocks, I just didn't get them done. And plus, we're kind of prototyping those shocks based off of nylon. Uh, it's kind of elastic when printed. Um, yeah, you can see those shocks are much better than the other ones, which are not quite perfected yet. I put it together wrong, too, by the way. Yeah? Well, you have a list of, you know, you mentioned all these different uh, materials we can use. Do you have a list of that on your website that we'll have access to? So there is, a, I forget the name of the project, but um, a competitor, uh, which is Bucobot, um, one of the guys, uh, look for the, his name is, uh, who's a, well, his handle is like, who's a what's it or something like that? He's a, he's a real proponent of um, bringing all these materials into one list. And then uh, and manufacturers will be able to say, hey, here's the materials that we have available. Because all of these materials have slight differences. They use different dyes, they use different mixtures, different, um, you know, the polymers involved in all. There's even like stuff that chains together PLA into longer strands so that it can be extruded and still have strength. All of these variables. So that project, it's the UF, ah, I can't remember it, but um, he lists all the available materials. Some of them are quite exotic and expensive. But I think the boots on the ground uh, benefit for this project, uh, which will, you go on Google Plus and you'll see him and the project. Um, the benefit is someday taking a QR code, click with your camera, and the software knowing exactly what settings need to be used for that specific manufacturer, filament size, color, and maybe even when, which run at the factory that uh, that came out of, and it will mean better prints someday. We, I do want to tie into that project, but A, I don't have the software to tie into it yet, and it's not quite mature yet. So there's, there's tons. It's thermoplastic, so think about a plastic that doesn't melt. Good luck. Is that iMaterialize? Is that what it is? No, um, so if you go, I'll, you know, it's funny because if you follow me on Google+, Plus, um, these same people all pop up, or uh, occasionally he posts on Twitter. Um, but anyway, Bucobot, uh, which is D's Maker, is the name of the, I think, dot org or something. It's weird. But who's a what's it? Yeah. Right on the handles on the board. If I knew how to spell it, I would. Oh, exactly. <laughs> so what's it? You should look up on your phone, dude. Find that project. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing your story. It's a very sure. empowering and compelling story. Given all the... Oh, I have a two-part question, if I may. Uh, well, if I, I can remember the two parts, though. Really long one or really short. I'll give you the long one first. Um, given all the influential people that you've met, and maybe even ones that you haven't met, who would you say um, would be the most inspirational to you um, to cultivate your entrepreneurial spirit? Hmm. So the first one, I'll, I'll let you ask the second one here in a second, but um, you know what's funny is some of the people I've met have been a complete disappointment uh, because maybe, the, like for me, my timing was good, the design was good enough, and the maker community were, were all converging. So there's crowdfunding, uh, 3D printing, and the maker community all converged, and I was kind of like the poster boy, but really I just got struck by lightning. It was really good or really bad timing. <laughs> you know, it's like, that happened. So I've met, uh, you know, Dale Darty um, is absolutely, he's a maker, he's uh, the CEO, founder, um, he's co-founder of O'Reilly Media, and now he's a, he's a friend. Um, he's uh, up in Sebastopol, he founded Make Magazine, and really encompasses, he's completely inspiring, uh, he encompasses what it is to be a maker, product design fascinates him. He's extremely articulate on um, education's role in this important process. Um, he is fantastic. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, as far as designers, um, uh, like as far as entrepreneurial spirit, I would probably say Richard Van Haas. Um, he's the guy that did RoboHand. Uh, he is inspirational in this way. He, he sounds brutal, but... He was a, a woodworker that cut some of his fingers off accidentally, and that was what he knew how to do. So he was a machinist as well, and so he machined these uh, finger, this fingered glove that would slip on, and I've worn it, it's great. Uh, puts it on, and it extends the missing uh, appendage here so that he can do this pincher movement. Opposable thumbs turns out to be extremely useful, right, when you're making. So then uh, he kind of thought about you know doing something with a 3D printer that because people were asking to move one joint 
and uh, people were asking him to make those, they were also missing a finger, and he had a lot of compassion on those folks. So he has given away like over 100,000 of those uh, robo fingers. Um, so he thought, There's gotta be, we've got to let the community help. So the community, uh, by doing open source, he said, "Here's the I've designed this with a friend, um, this uh, robo hand. Uh, it has use for, you know, you can mod it if you got two fingers missing, whatever you need to do. And it ended up kind of getting uh, some real traction when he discovered these uh, kids that had a genetic, you know, uh, challenge where they didn't have fingers. And they had they, just like that. And they could do this. So he designed this so they could grasp. And it's done all mechanical, no electronics. Um, and you know, like 60,000 downloads instantly, and like people all over the world are doing this. So I got to meet him and, and uh, collaborate with him um, fairly recently, last year. Uh, and he flew in from South Africa. I said, have you ever been to the States? He goes, this is the first time. I'm like, what brought you out? And he's like, you and this other guy, Mick, uh, because you feel like the real deal, you want to help people, and that's what I want to do. And so he was not influenced by money. In fact, he's had people offer millions of dollars and he's flatly refused it because he's old enough to know that when people offer you money, you're giving up control instantly. Uh, my CFO was a venture capitalist and has, his last company sold to Yahoo and all this. Um, and I asked him, so when, when do I give up control? If we're Because we're looking for money. When do I give up control? And he said that the, the second you took one dollar, you gave up control. That's when you start to lose control. Richard won't do it. Open source, now MakerBot, I don't think I'm saying anything that's, uh, I can't say. Um, MakerBot also likes this hand like I do. I'm phrasing this carefully. Um, they got so much interest from promoting the RoboHand that now you'll see MakerBot and RoboHand closely in the same phrase often. Um, I'll give you this, the back story later. But anyway, the point is, uh, it's a very popular item. Um, that MakerBot has done some great videos that promote what he's doing. And he wanted to, uh, to make it more possible for these to get out to more people. So now he's got this network of people that are printing RoboHands for free. They're giving them away to kids in need and adults. He's uh, now partnered with me to take some parts and build a printer that is custom built to build RoboHands on site, in country, in like Syria and Afghanistan, and he's going there with the printers to train locals to do it. The project that I uh, participated with him was, um, we sent some printers to Africa. If you watch the videos, they're on MakerBots. Arr. But anyway, the ones that we trained them, and uh, these guys how to make robo hands, and we printed them on PrinterBots and MakerBots, and um, there was another vendor, I forget. Um, it might have been Cube. But, uh, Anyway, so we sent him over and installed uh, at a hospital at, in the Nuba Mountain region, a very dangerous region, where these kids, it's so sad, um, there's so many bombs, that many, many, many children are missing arms. And so we helped, it was really Richard, I don't deserve any credit, but I was there, you know, like, giving him some ideas. He's got an arm now, he's working on a leg. This guy is completely inspiring, not because of what he's done in business, um, but because of the t taking the technology and putting it to the right use to help the world without, you know, everything else be damned because this is the right thing to do. And I'm sure that will resonate with Samir. Because uh, we were talking about, like, uh, hey, let's get this technology out in the world, um, connect people with printers, connect people with the need um, to, to take this, you know, printer army or, or Samir, who... So, it, oh, Adam. Yeah. Tell me your first name again. Aaron. Aaron, I'm sorry. Aaron, this dream of the printer army uh, coming to the, uh, the you know, times of need coming together. Printer force. Printer force. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Sorry, don't let me coin any phrases backwards. So anyway, I, I think it's great. And it's a, these are kind of a, that, that, that kind of thinking is, it's so wonderful because it's, the vision is huge. And it is uh, something that's totally doable. What you have to do is find that it's going to take money, and it's going to take people. Um, so to converge all of these, uh, it's so unusual to find these, this great vision in a guy like Richard, um, who really doesn't care about the finances. Um, it worked itself out because the vision was compelling enough, and the need was compelling enough. So maybe we'll get there, but man, I sure wish uh, money wasn't part of that obstacle, but it is. 
Oh, wait, second part of the question. Oh, yeah, sorry, thank you. What's this? That's an earbud. Uh, you put your earbuds in the top, wrap the cord around, uh -oh. stick it in your pocket, and it doesn't get all... I mean, I hate that. I tie mine in knots like... Uh, cool. That's just a little example. It was printed in three parts, but all at once, you snap it together. Thanks. Yes, sir. So, you, I mean, you're operating in an emerging market right now, and there's a lot of new entrants coming in at your price point. Um, how much of that do you consider noise, and how much do you actually go back and reflect on your, uh, your product innovation charter? Yeah. Well said. Um, so, first of all, they're lying. <laughs> No, I know. Like the we got a lot of competition in your price point. No, I don't. And the reason I kind of say that uh, is because every time I hear of a $200 printer, um, the reality is, and Jeremy knows this too, there is a very, very real, I mean, no, I don't make in China. I make in Lincoln, California. All right? So I know my costs are higher than if I did go to China. But there's other obstacles to going to China. And right now we have this crazy, like, people coming back to American manufacturing. It's kind of this theme. Obama's talking about it. Okay, so there is a very real um, component to manufacturing moving back to America. But it's guys like me that are like really careful with their money. And, you know, these printers aren't going to get much cheaper than what I've offered them at. Uh, the, I had one at $299. The reason I don't have one at $299 right now is that was too low. <laughs> There's not enough margin if you want to break beyond the first channel of offering on your own website, direct to the, the consumer. Um, Amazon called me. Now that's a good day when Amazon calls you. Um, and they wanted to be, you know, the preferred vendor, whatever it's called. I forget all the terminology with them. Excuse me. But um, they said we want you to be, uh, you know, your your leader and you know, MakerBot is is good, and we're selling some of those, and we've got some other guys coming in. Um, but you've got a track record. It's funny that two years is a track record <laughs> in this industry. Um, but I'm an old man now. Uh, they said, we, we think we'd like you to sell the products and we'd push your brand and all this. So we've done that. Now, um, I literally, and this isn't BS, I, like right now, we've been selling them and it's increasing and they have this, it's like drinking from the fire hose. Um, they're like, more! We want more! Every time we put them in, they, and we send pallets, um, they're gone like that within a couple of days. So there's a, there's a huge um, market out there if the price point is right. And the, the model that sold the best was a 299. Um, we've bumped it up to two, uh, I'm sorry, 349. And we've upgraded some of the parts, the metal extruder that you see on both of these bots. Um, just more reliable and the metal bed. You gotta have a flat surface so we're done fiddling around with wood. So anyway, at this uh, kind of bare minimums, it's gonna cost couple hundred dollars in parts. So how do you feel about, you know, a 22% margin? Well, maybe that's fine if you're a small guy in Lincoln, California, but if you're trying to, we've got a million dollars of orders in, with uh, POs with Amazon right now um, that we can't fill because I don't have the money to order the parts to build a million dollars worth of printers. you got to have a million to make a million. Um, so there's a huge market, but when I talked to the Kickstarter guys, I saw one of the show, uh, was that Burbank or New York? Uh, the little bitty printer, $200 on his sign. Uh, it's like, $200 printer, oh, Brooke, are you nervous? Those guys in there? And I went and talked to him, and I'm like, okay, I'm not nervous. <laughs> First of all, they said right in front, it's like, well, that's the introductory Kickstarter price. Um, so that is total loss leader, and they don't know how much they're going to lose. I kind of hope they don't, they don't sell tons of them because, just for their own sake, because what they don't understand is the tax implications and all that. Very smart guys, um, some unique uh, approaches in their design. It's not horrible, um, but at scale, they, that printer's going to have to be four or $500. And they're telling people 200 So he's already doing the wrong thing with expectations. He's, he's building on a bed of sand, and so it's dangerous. So a lot of these like cheap, cheap printers, just look at the reviews. The only printer at, at anywhere near a $300 price that has any respect at all, and some people don't like it, is the printer bot simple that I'm the only one. So am I nervous? No. Um, but I've realized uh, on this new printer over here, it is also called the Simple. It's red, it's in metal, it's aluminum, it's steel, it's powder coated. Um, we're, it, the final model will have 12 millimeter bars and the Z, you can get a handle, it's super rigid. Um, that guy is going to retail at $5.99 because I want enough margin in there to sell to Amazon. The next channel you need to look at is other online retailers. And then eventually, um, we have, I can't even talk about this, but there's a you know, big brand that wants to carry our printers in their store, so retail. 
the only way to make enough room for those margins to work out when they're begging for over 20%, and some have been ridiculous and asked for 50, and that's just not happening anymore, not with Amazon out there. Um, now the, the margins that people look for are like 20%. Amazon, essentially, we, get, uh, we give them 17%, which is shocking to some. What? They don't take more than that? They don't. Not when you're a leader in a space that's so hot and they can't keep them on the shelves. So it may not stay at that, at that margin all the time, but to give enough room so we can all make money, that's going to be a $600 printer. Do you see these margins going down or up? The what? Do you see the margins going down or up? The margins going down. Well, I tell you what, I am definitely a disruptor. Um, and both by design, I like to stir things up. Uh, but also, uh, just out of necessity to survive, my prices have to be low enough to be compelling, differentiating from the leaders. Like, I don't think, uh, and MakerBot was a, a disruptor too, but 3D systems and Stratasys didn't know what to do. Um, I'm guessing. Um, with a, a printer for $1,200, these are supposed to cost 60 grand at the cheapest. Like 200,000 just a few years ago wasn't unheard of. What's shocking was that when I took my solid, solid work course, um, they were, actually it's funny, they were actually 3D printer salesmen too. And they had like a little distributorship and they were the guys and they were very proud of all their products and they were neat. Um, I, I was like, whoa, this is awesome. But I had one in my garage and I, they would show me these prints and they were like, yeah, well, check this out, you know, and hold up this print. I'm like, that's nice. Here's one of mine. He was like, oh, was that on a was that on a Z Corp or was that a was that a Stratasys? And I'm like, that was on a five hundred dollar printer that I built with hand tools, a screwdriver and a pair of pliers in my garage. And the guy was like, Well those are just toys. And I'm like, you thought it was a professional print. <laughs> I don't think I could pay you to print that on your printer <laughs> you know, for that much. Uh, for five hundred dollars. So he was very uncomfortable and just ignored me. You know, I was like, All right, well, we're not going away. So these, the margins that these fat and happy cats, you know, even like thing, uh, not Thingiverse, but um, SketchUp, believe it or not, it's embarrassing for mechanical engineers to think this, but SketchUp is cutting into AutoCAD and Autodesk. And these, you know, Tinkercad, designed for kids, is cutting into potential profits for a behemoth like Autodesk. Now, I've met Carl Bass and all that, and I like his maker mentality, and um, it's, there's some fantastic things coming out of that company. Ridiculous. But when I went to my mechanical engineer, said, Brooke, I'm tired of dragging my computer around. Just get a Windows, because I'm a Mac guy. Get a Windows computer and get Inventor on there and let me do some work without dragging my computer. I was like, okay, I'll check on it. Dude, all the plugins this guy needs, 10 grand for AutoCAD, I mean, uh, Auto Inventor. It's like, forget it, forget it. So, disruptor, and um, now don't get me wrong, you guys are going to be pros. You'll need to buy a tool that is appropriate for the job, right? Um, but we're a disruptor. The margins are coming down because I can. I don't have a big ship to turn. Yes, sir? How close are we to actually being able to design with our hands using Connect and Xbox One? So, I have. And just throwing shit together. Right. And then plug it into the, the box. There is, uh, does it, what, what's that little um, box that sits in front, in front of your Mac? It was a Kickstarter, I think. Uh, I forget the name of it. I have one. Uh, leap, 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 leap Motion. Leap Motion. Leap motion. There, there is some, uh, it's kind of like, almost like throwing pottery on a yeah. pottery wheel. You, know, that, that, you can do that now. Um, there's also another company that's, I think they're doing a Kickstarter. They reached out to me. I forget the name of them. I was supposed to conference with them. Um, it's really fun being in this space because I'm like a nobody and I get these sweet products to do, like to test. He's got these two things that are in air and, uh, what's the name of that company? Gosh! Anyway, so uh, he, he does it uh, with, I've tried all of the stylus and all these weird mechanical things and they're all kind of weird. Um, this is interesting because it's not like this, use the force yet, <laughs> but it's like, uh, he, he does, there's buttons, there's directional sensors, because just this with like the leap motion is kind of funky, I mean, it's weird. Um, and it's not precise. So uh, this gives it like a high degree of precision, and there's like all this roll and yaw and all this kind of stuff in two directions, you can move closer in front of them. So it, it uses uh, off-the-shelf technology and with these controllers that, that help. Um, how far away? I think, well, that'll be out within a year. But you, you see all of this, you see all this stuff kind of like the, the bleeding edge 
um, come out and you know, here's the problem with uh, 3D printing. Well, here's a major problem with 3D printing right now. The expectation is kind of set by an iPad. All right, here's what I mean. Um, it's so mature, I mean, the iPad is such, a, it's so mature in, in computers back in the 70s. That's where we're at with 3D printing. We're at the Apple One. Maybe the Apple II, maybe. But I would be very, very slow to say that. Um, because like I said, when you get your cube in here, now don't get me wrong, it'll print for a while without problems, and then there'll be problems. Um, you buy MakerBot, it'll print for a while beautifully, and then there will be problems. Now, how upset you are about the problems you're having may be attached to the price you paid. And when I sold at $299, people are generally fairly pleased. You know, they get some prints out, and then they got to make it, maybe figure out how to clean out the filament, or you know, replace a belt or tighten a belt or something. Um, but when you spend three grand, you get real mad, uh, and it, they're they're like growing so fast. They've shipped you know like 50,000 printers um, compared to my 15, and probably more. Who knows? Uh, but you know that's a lot to handle for a growing company. They're in the hundreds of employees, like 500, and a lot of that is customer support and people building them. And I'm at 20, so they they've got a problem to kind of get this down. But anyway, so the expectation is set by the iPad. What I mean is, it's so easy to use an iPad. I give it to my son. He's he's nine now, and he's like a whiz. But um, we are not there with the printers. Don't expect it to be there. It's not there. And anybody that goes out and says. It's incredible. You can design anything and build anything, and it's uh, three, Cube does this. I think they're sorry they did it, but she always used to say it's coloring books simple. It's coloring books simple. It's kind of condescending in one respect, and then secondly, it's not that simple. <laughs> it's it's hard right now. So there's another question. Yes, let me get yours. Um, so your target market is, is kids. Like, what age and how much knowledge do they need to know? To um, I, my initial target market was families and kids. I want the vision is a printer in every school first and every home second. Um, I do know people without computers but it's extremely rare. It took us what 40, 40 years to get there. Um, so this isn't going to happen overnight but while kids was my first uh, you know in schools the reason I wanted that is because if they get it now and I've talked to fourth grade classes they love it. They wanted play dates with my son. I think they wanted a play date with me and the printers. Uh, one kid admitted that. So they're very interested at a very young age, so it needs to be usable and affordable for those folks so that we can change the world in five years. But the truth is, everybody's buying them um, all across all market segments. So what do I target? I don't worry about who's buying them right now because it's all over the freaking map. It's weird. Like the guy that's doing the Captain America 2 movie wants some to sell. I mean, he's like, ah, oh, use yours on set and all this stuff. Um, like that's a like really obscure, like professional using it, making lots of money. Um, and it's like a cheap little bot uh, to, to kids, to professionals. A guy that designed the 787 interior and exterior has a printed bot on his desk. I mean, it's like, what? <laughs> he's like, ah, I just don't like sharing the big expensive printers with everybody else. I want to print when I want to print right on my desk. So it's, it's really a market that's so broad and so far reaching, it's, it's so hard to focus, I don't. I focus on price point and ease of use is all I'm thinking about this year. Ease of use, ease of use, ease of use in software and just mechanically more sound and everything that will make it easier to use. My goal is the iPad, print button, and it prints. I don't have to think about all that stuff, it just prints. Um, but we're a long way off from that experience, so I don't know. If that was my start, and right now it's more general than that. Yes, that I'm just wondering how, how much knowledge of 3D printing it takes to operate one of these. So it does take some knowledge, yes. um, specifically because problems are coming, and if you don't know how to tighten a belt on that, by the way, it's like an Allen wrench. You do this, <laughs> and feel, oh, that's tight, okay. So it's not like it's um, insurmountable, but right now um, the software is such that it doesn't know what you're printing. So in other words, I could be printing a toothpick standing straight up, which is a very bad idea, but I've seen guys try it. <laughs> it the, the model could be that toothpick standing in the middle of your, your print bed, or it could be like a big round thing that is gonna stick well, and uh, you know, so there's decisions that you have to make based on is it gonna be hollow, 
or is this going to be something that I'm going to bolt my mountain bike to hold the handlebars, and if I design it improperly, I'm going to die? You know what I mean? Or is it like a little octopus that sits on my desk? Two very different uh, products or you know, end results that you have to make some decisions. You have to choose the right material, choose the right infill, um, pay special attention to overhangs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why you need to know, so know something. The good thing for me is it's actually teaching you a little bit about science. Like, you have to know about the materials a little bit and understand the differences. Um, or you don't have to understand the difference between black and red ink. You know what I mean? You just print, it's whatever, because what, people are gonna die if I got the wrong ink in there? Um, but people actually could die if you're designing skateboards, you know, and they're going downhill or whatever. So, I think it's good that people are learning, um, but you're right, there are some barriers to entry that are, you know, you gotta be willing to learn a little bit just about the temperatures involved. You gotta, you gotta dial in your temperature a little bit, but it's just like hit and miss. You try a couple of degrees higher, does that work better? Oh no, let's go the other direction. Does that work better? Okay, that's where I need to be on that filament. So there's some little nuances like that that are very, very helpful. But I teach guys to print, like I can teach you to print in like an hour. Um, <coughs> if you're willing to kind of buckle down and understand a couple of concepts, you'll be okay. Yes, ma'am? Let's take one last question. Oh, okay. <laughs> class oh, right, right. yeah, sorry. So one last question. Yeah, what, one more. You may have covered this already, but does, does any of the print material use recycled plastic or is it all new? So, interesting thing about recycling as a value company, it's more expensive. So, if I were to take in plastic that had been recycled and produce filament with that recycled material, it would cost more money. So, I don't use it. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't like the idea of recycling plastic. I have hundreds of pounds of, well, I buy plastic by a ton. But uh, I have hundreds of pounds of failed prints from my Kickstarter, like hundreds of prints. Probably close to 200 pounds of failed prints or old outdated designs. I'm hanging on to those because that was the first time that was extruded. And by the way, the material degrades. If you extrude it 20 times, it's going to be junk. Uh, it won't have the qualities that you need in a thermoplastic. So I knew I've extruded it one time and they're waiting until I finish my recycler and extruder which we're working on the extruder now, um, so that you can grind up these parts, push it through um, an extruder to uh, enough precision that you can feed them back into the printers. And we're actually dreaming about, and this isn't unique to me, everybody's thinking that. Um, we're thinking about some large scale printers that actually just use the ground up bits or the pellets so that the, uh, the price of printing comes way down, like 10 times cheaper. And my dream is more of the big vision, save the world thing, where we're taking, like, this one island wrote me in the Kickstarter. And uh, they said, we're a very small island in the Pacific. We have no resources whatsoever. And the land's been stripped bare in World War II. They're using it as a, you know, a hop across an airfield. He, he goes, uh, but we have tons of plastic that wash up on the shore. And he goes, if you could make a recycler, that allows me to recycle that PET or whatever it is coming in on the shore and make a material that I can extrude. And, a, and you actually would have to make a special printer with a larger nozzle and less um, exact and precise. But that's okay for somebody with a bunch of trash on the, the shore and they have no resources. You could put that to good use. Um, you know, you could pot water in it. Uh, you could use it as a pot, like a toilet. Um, these are like third world issues, right? Carrying water and sanitary measures. Um, so a recycle uh, system where you grind up the stuff, you extrude it, and then you use it in a printer that's been modified to take very dirty material um, could be world changing. Um, that's a dream, and we're working on it now with um, some very large printers um, and a recycler that has to grind, and then uh, this extruder. So anyway, um, that's the dream. I, I do believe in uh, protecting the environment, it's just that I'm not building my company on recycled material yet. There is a biodegradable material called PLA. It's funny that they call it biodegradable because it's like impossible to reuse. Uh, it, it does break down over you know a bazillion years in the soil. And that. It's made from corn, so it might take six months to like decon if it was in like the right temperature water. I mean, it's just funny. But anyway, so um, I think it's a good question though. Uh, it's something that we need to look at for sure. Now, I'm supposed to be done. Right. I will so, hang out. Yeah, uh, so you can ask me questions, questions later. Uh, you know, but thanks Thank a lot, you. Brooke. Thank you. Thank you.
so we'll, we'll be, meet back in the uh, class in about five minutes. Let's take a little five minute break. Thank you, Mino, for hosting us.